let's go over the chapter three test here. And this is version B that I gave to you folks. Um, supposed to find the critical points and use the second derivative test. So you're supposed to use the second derivative test to determine whether if they are maximums or minimums or neither. Now, some of you on your test didn't use the second derivative test. I gave you credit, but I asked you to do the second derivative test. So we're going to have to have the first derivative. This should be a fairly easy one for you to take the derivative of. Power rule says 6x squared. Power rule says plus 6x and minus 12. And the derivative of the constant is zero. So there's the first derivative. And the second derivative is 12x plus 6. Okay. So a couple points for each doing each of those derivatives, right? And then to find critical points, you set the first derivative equal to zero. So I'm going to go 6x squared plus 6x minus 12 equals 0. You could do the quadratic formula. You could factor. You could complete the square. You could graph it, find the zeros. You need to find the zeros to this. Now, everything is divisible by 6, and since it's equal to 0, I could, instead of just factoring out 6, I can divide everything by 6, and I get x squared plus x minus 2 equals 0. And that's pretty easy to factor. That's x and x to make x squared, and a 2 and a 1 to make 2. It has to be minus, so one of these are negative. If I put the negative there and the plus there, I get plus 2x minus 1x, which gives me the 1x. So it looks like x is negative 2 to make that 0 or x equals plus 1 to make that be 0. So those are the critical places. They call them the critical points. Now to find out whether that's a max or min or neither, we plug it into the second derivative. That's called the second derivative test. So I'm going to find f double prime of negative 2. So that'd be negative 2 times 12, negative 24, plus 6, negative 18. Negative 18 means it's concaved down. And if it's concave down, this must be a max. F double prime at 1 would be 12 plus 6, which is a positive 18 which means the curve is concaved up. And if it's concaved up, that means this has to be a min. Now, if the second derivative came out to be 0, then it would be a special inflection point. But we didn't have that on either of those. So there's number 1. Number 2. People really struggled taking the derivative of this. We're supposed to find local max and mins and inflection points. So max and mins happen at uh, critical uh, at when the first derivative is equal to zero. Uh, inflection points happen at the second derivative equal to zero. So we need to take a bit the derivative of this. So f prime of x. Several people, many of you, did okay on this, except you didn't do the chain rule on e to the minus x. This, most of you did it as a product rule. So they took the derivative of the first, which is 1, times the second, plus the derivative of the second. So we have to take the derivative of the power, which is minus 1, times derivative of e to something is e to the something times the first. So that minus the derivative of the power was the thing that many of you missed. And if you do that, if you have this, 
you've got, uh, if you distribute the minus e to the x, you get 1 e to the minus x plus a negative x e to the minus x and a negative e to the minus x. And these two cancel out and you get simply negative x e to the minus x as the first derivative. And this is only, this is never zero. So the only way this could equal zero would happen only if x equaled zero. It's the only way that would equal zero. So we have either a max or a min or possibly an inflection point at zero. Now let's take the second derivative. Now, if you messed up on the first derivative, this is going to be really hard to do correctly. So, the second derivative, we have a product rule again. The derivative of negative x is negative 1 times the second plus the derivative of the second, which is negative 1 times e to the x, a negative x, because the you've got to take the derivative of the inside, which is negative 1 times the derivative of e to the minus x is e to the minus x times the first. And so we get negative 1 e to the minus x plus x e to the minus x, and we can factor out the e to the minus x, and we get 1 minus 1 plus x times e to the minus x. This is never 0, so the only way the second derivative if of x is equal to, uh, of f of x is equal to 0 is if this was 0, which means add x equal 1. So that's going to be an inf inflection point. And I asked where it's at. So I just need the x value. Here I asked what is the global max. So I wanted the height and the depth of those two places. But we have an inflection point at x equal 1. And then... We need to know whether at zero it's a max or min. So you put zero into the second derivative. e to the zero is one. And then we get minus one plus zero, which is minus one. So f, f double prime of zero is negative one times one, which is less than zero. So it's con caved down, and if it's concave down, we have a max at zero. So max happens at x equals zero. Now I could put in zero and find out how high that is, but I didn't ask for that. The, and since there's only one critical point, there isn't a local minimum. Now, the global max, now we will have to put, we have a max at zero. If I put zero into my original function, f of zero is zero plus one, one times e to the mi zero, which is one, so I get one. So we get a, the maximum at the local max is one. Now, I don't know if that's the global max because I need to check at the endpoints. So I need to check f of minus 1. Let's see what that is. Plug it into the original function. Minus 1 plus 1 is 0 times f to the plus 1, so uh, e to the plus 1, but 0 times anything is 0. So that's less than that, so it's not, that's not a global max. And I want to check at the other endpoint at f of 5. If I put 5 into the original equation, 
I get 5 plus 1, which is 6, e to the negative 6. Now, just to understand how big that is, I'm going to type it in. 6 e to the negative 6. Now, that negative 6 is telling me I'm dividing by 6 by e six times, which is going to make this pretty small. And it turns out to be approximately 0 0.01487, blah, 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 blah. All right. So that's not bigger than 1. So the global max happens at where the local max is, and it is 1. I'll put down here, I don't need this, at x equals 0. And what's the global min? What's the lowest place we got? Well, at one end of the interval, we got 0. At the other end, we got something bigger than 0. And there is no other extrema, so it must be 0. So 0, and it happens at the left end, at x equal minus 1. This turned out to be uh, tough for, for you folks. But the rest of this is, should be what you're, you're using. Similar stuff as you did up here. First derivative test, you set the derivative equal to zero and find critical points where local max can be possibly inflection. Set the second derivative equal to zero, you get the inflection points. Then you check the endpoints and the max, the local max and local mins to find whether you've got a global max or a global mix someplace. Global max or global min someplace. Okay. Page two. All right. This is match the the description of f, this is the description of f, with a graph of the derivative of f shown. So these are f primes. So this is telling me the slope of f. This whole graph is below the x-axis, so the values of this, which are the slope values of f, are all negative. So the slope is always negative. And it's very negative here, and it gets less negative here. So it's very steep negative, and then it gets less negative, which means this has to be concaved up, decreasing and concaved up. This one, I notice, is also all negative, and this one, so they're all decreasing. The increasing ones are gone, because these are all negative height graphs. Now this one's less negative, gets more negative, so it's it's some it's got negative, but then it gets more negative and then less negative. So it has to be a graph that's going down some but gets steeper down because it's more negative and then less steep down. So this is a decreasing graph that's both concaved up and down. So this is E. It's concaved down and then up. I didn't say it, specify the order, but it's concaved up and down. This one, it's all negative, so it's got to be decreasing. And it's going from a not very negative slope to a more negative slope. So that's going to be concave down decreasing, which is A. All right. A farmer wants to make two pens next to a barn. Now, some of you are not uh, savvy about if you've got a barn and you build a fence, you don't need to put a fence next to the barn. So you've got a fence that you have to build a fence here here, and here, and here. And you don't need any fencing on the barn because the barn's the fence. And we've got 150 feet. Now, it doesn't matter where you put X or Y. Many of you put something like 
x here, x here, x here, and called the whole thing y. So I'll go with that. So the area that we're supposed to be maximizing is going to be x times y. Well, I can't maximize area if it's got two variables. So I got to get it to single variable. So I have to use a constraint. And the constraint on this is that I only have 150 feet of fencing to build the three X fences and the one Y fence. So three X plus Y is 150 feet of fencing. And if I solve for y by subtracting 3x, I get y equals 150 minus 3x. I can put that in for my y, and I get the area. Now, the function of a single variable x will be x times 150 minus 3x. And I can take the derivative of this using product rule. Or I can use distribute the x and I get 150x minus 3x squared, taking x times this and times that. So then I can take the derivative and that would be 150 minus 6x. Okay. So 150. If I set the second derivative, a first derivative, equal to 0, I get 150 minus 6x equals 0. Add 6x to both sides, I get 150 equals 6x, divide by 6, and I get x equals 25. And it's a dimension, and we're measuring in feet, so this must be 25 feet. That's only one dimension, and I wanted both dimensions. So how long is y? Now, if you put y here, you'll get the length of one pen. If you used y here, you're going to get the length of both pens. So, and I asked for the dimensions of each pen. So if I solve for this y, I'm going to have to cut it in half to get the dimensions of that pen. But let's go back. Let's see. Up here, it says y is 150 minus 3x. Well, if x is 25, 3 times 25 is 75. So y would be 150 minus 3 times 25, or 75, which means that y is 75 feet. So the dimension of a pen, the dimension of a single pen, will be 25 feet feet by half of 75, 37.5 feet. Since the whole thing is 75, one side would be half of 75, 37 and a half. Nope. Okay. This one was a little bit harder than once we did in class, but I still thought it was possible to do, and boy, people were really lost on this. Cylindrical tank, and I don't care if you draw it laying down or standing up, it still has a circular end and a circular end and a side that if you unwrap it, it's a rectangle. And this is the formula for the area. So there's the two circles, and here's the rectangle. It's the distance around 2 pi r times the height times h. But we're not trying to maximize or minimize this, but the cost must be limited to 1400 and $14 per square foot for the circular ends. 
So the two circular ends, if I write a cost formula, it's going to be the circular ends, pi, uh, pi r squared for one of them, times 2 for both of them, times 14. So it's going to be 14 pi r squared for the cost of the circular ends. Oh, times, times 2. 14 times 2. So it's 28 pi r squared. And the cost for the side, and this is the area of the side, is $7 per square foot. So I got 7 times 2 pi r h. Well, that's 14 pi r h. And this cost can must be limited to, so this is a constraint, to 1,400. That's a constraint. But what are we trying to maximize? We're trying to maximize the volume. And the volume is pi r squared h. It's not a function of a single variable. So I need to get either the r or the h to have a replacement for it. Well, I'm going to use my constraint. I'm going to solve for, I could try solving for r squared, but that's messy. There's only an h in one place, so that's the easiest. So I'm going to subtract this from both sides. Uh, let's see. It's plus. Uh, we're going to subtract this from both sides, so I'm going to get $1,400 minus the 28 pi r squared dollars for the ins, and that's equal to the 14 uh, times pi r, r h, and then I'm going to divide by 14 pi r, 14 pi r. R, and I'm going to, the 14 will go into both of those. Uh, oh, uh, but the pi won't go into the 14, uh, but it does go into there. So putting the, uh, uh, I'll write it this way, 1400 over 14 pi R minus 28 pi r squared over 14, 14 pi r. The 14 goes in there, and I get 100 divided by pi r minus 14 and 28 is 2. Pi's cancel, and r cancels 1. 2r equals h. From the constraint, solving for h, I find out this is what h is equal to. So that's what I put in for the h here. So the volume becomes pi r squared times h. Haven't done any calculus yet. I just finally got V, the volume, as a function of R only using the constraint to remove the H from the volume formula. Now I can distribute this pi R squared or I can use the product rule, but I think I'll distribute. It'll make it an easier derivative because if I take pi R squared times this, I'm going to get pi r squared times 100 divided by pi r, and I can do some reduction there, minus, and this would be minus uh, 2 pi r to the third. Let's reduce this. So this is 100 r minus uh, 2 pi r to the third. 
think I'm ready now to take the derivative. All of up to here has just been some algebra. The derivative of this is 100 minus 6 pi r to the, no, 3 times 2, 6, yes, pi r squared. And if I set v prime of r equal to 0, I get 100 minus 6 pi r squared equals 0. Adding this to both sides, I get 100 equals uh, 6 pi r squared divided by 6 pi. r squared, take the square root of both sides, and the uh, square root of 100 is 10, over the square root of 6 pi, plus or minus, but the plus 1 is the only one that makes sense. Can't have a negative radius in this problem, and so I get the radius has to be 10 divided by the square root of 6 pi, 2.303 uh, feet is the radius. Determine the radius that would maximize the volume. And I just did. Number six, the conveyor belt. It's dumping wheat off and it's forming a conical pile, cone-shaped pile, where the height is twice the radius. Any questions on that? Okay. And if the radius has a rate of increase, so radius, rate of increase, so dr dt is 0 0.25 meters per minute. So that's dr dt. It's a rate change in the radius with respect to time. That's a rate. When the height is 4, so that's a fixed thing. The height is changing constantly. Height of 4 meters. So we don't use this in any formula. We just use it at the end as a fixed point in time when the height is 4. So we can't use this in the formula at this point. Just keep it out of your formulas. A lot of people kept using the formula H as 4 in the formula. What is the rate that the wheat is being added? So that's rate of wheat being added. That's going to be the volume being added. So we're trying to find dV, dt. Now V the relationship between V and R, which is what we need, V and R, to be able to get the related rates, we have to have V as a function of R. But we have V as one-third pi R squared H. Two variables. We need to remove one of those. Well, the constraint on this is the shape of the pile. And the H is 2R. So I put 2R in place of H to get V as a function of a single variable R is 1 third pi R squared times 2R. Now, some of you got to there and said, I got to do product rule. You can, but certainly would be a lot easier if you just multiplied this together and called it 2 thirds pi r cubed. So now we can take the derivative 
and set it equal to zero to maximize or minimize or find, find the related rate. So I'm going to take the derivative with respect to time. So derivative of v with respect to time is dv dt. And the derivative of this, which has the variable r, with respect to time, I'm going to get a dr dt for the derivative of the inside times the derivative of this, thinking r is a variable. So I'm going to take 3 times 2 thirds pi r to the second. So this is a fixed point. This now is how the volume changes with respect to how the radius is changing. So now at this fixed point in time, and that fixed point in time is when the height is 4 meters. We can now use the 4 as a fixed point in time. But the 4 is the height. h equals 4 meters. But h is 2r. So 2r is 4 meters, which means r is 2 meters. So we can use r as 2 and the rate radius at this fixed point in time is 25 meters per minute. So we're going to use those in this equation. And the rate of change of the volume is, let's see, the threes cancel out here. So it's 2 pi r, which is 2 meters, squared times dr dt, which was 0.25 meters per minute. So I'm going to get meters squared times meters, meters cubed per minute, which is a volume change. I'm going to get 2 pi times 4 times 0.25 meters cubed per minute. So 0.25 is a quarter of 4 is 1, so I get 2 pi meters cubed per minute, or decimal approximation, 6.28 meters cubed per minute is the rate, the volume dv dt, the rate of volume increase.